Welcome back to CTI 120, and it's Mr. Arnke with you for Chapter 4. We're going to look at network protocols and routing today. So our objectives are to describe the functions of core TCP IP protocol, identify how each protocol's information is formatted, how routers manage internetwork communication, and how to employ various utilities for network discovery and troubleshooting. So TCP IP is a suite of protocols, meaning a collection of protocols. That includes TCP, IP, UDP, ARP, and a couple of others. Now TCP IP protocols will basically process data through the encapsulation and process by adding headers. So the diagram we see here for figure 4.1 shows us how the payload, the original piece of data generated by the application, is processed into various PDUs or protocol data units by the addition of a header. In the case of the frame, if we go down to the data link layer, we see that there is also a trailer to finish the encapsulation process. Once the transmission is complete from the NIC of our generating host to the NIC of our recipient, the de-encapsulation process transforms the completed frame into a packet, segment, or datagram, depending on our format, and eventually the payload again. So layers 5, 6, and 7 often get um, entangled semantically, the way we look at it. So this includes how we process data and instructions uh, in payload form. So we have our, our raw data that has to be uh, cut up into smaller pieces so that they can then be transmitted. In certain cases, the files are small to be transmitted normally, but for, for the most part, especially if we're talking about transferring you know, files, those are going to be pretty substantial size-wise. Layer four is where we really start getting into the meat of being able to transition information over a network, how it has to be processed. At layer four, we usually use TCP, but sometimes may use UDP, to add an identifying header to the payload. The header includes a port number that identifies the app that is going to be receiving the information. At layer three, the network layer adds its own header and becomes a packet, which identifies the IP information. Layer two is where we add a header and trailer creating a frame and identify the source and destination MAC addresses. At layer one, there's no more trailer or header conversions done. The frame is received and converted into bits for transmission over the network, be it over fiber optic, cable, or through radio frequency transmission. So after the transmission is completed, the de-encapsulation process follows the exact same order, just in reverse. So in certain cases, we may have to pass through multiple connectivity devices, and there will be changes that are made to the outer layers of the capsule. So the PDU will be arriving at a switch, router, or multifunction device. As it arrives, the header and trailer of the frame, and possibly even the header of the packet, will be peeled off and replaced as it transitions from one point to the next. These devices are traditionally known by the highest OSI layer they can read and process. So if we're talking about a switch, that's traditionally layer two, but we may also see what's called a layer three switch, which operates in some capacities as a type of simplified router. Now TCP has three characteristics that make it suitable for a wide number of applications. The first being that it's connection oriented. TCP ensures that a connection or session is established using a three-step process called a three-way handshake before generating the host data necessary to actually carry out the transaction. It also involves sequencing and checksums. This means that there is a generated character string that is checked by the destination along with a sequence number for each segment to make sure that the data is arriving in the correct order and in the original condition. Flow control is going to be ways to rate our transmission based on how quickly a recipient can accept data. You don't want to necessarily overload a circuit, uh, well, rather a, a connection pathway. The circuit's a little bit too vague. Um, we don't want to overload a destination host, if you will, by trying to throw a ton of information at them at once that they can't handle. So flow control allows us to try and shift the amount of uh, transmitted material up or down in order to match their bandwidth. So here we can see a TCP segment and all the various things that we include other than the data itself. So if we look at the top of the header, we see that there's a source port, destination port, a sequence number, acknowledgement uh, flag field, 
the header length, then we've got our flags, that's what all those little three uh, character representations are. The sliding window size, that's flow control, uh, options and padding, but the important part is we look down at the data. Now the data obviously can be uh, different sizes based on what's called the MTU, maximum transmission unit. What we're looking at in the header is a lot of complex information. This means that it has a high amount of what's called overhead. So the three way handshake to establish a connection is this. Step one is the request for a connection. We call that the synchronization packet. Step two is synchronization slash acknowledgement and that's the response from the destination to say, okay, yeah, I'm ready to, to get this going. And then on step three, the acknowledgement of the connection, what's called the acknowledgement or ACK. After these three messages are processed, the data of the actual uh, application information is able to be sent. Sequence numbers will then increase by the number of bits included in each segment, and this confirms the correct length of the message was received. So if we send 2048 bits, the next sequence number will be 2048 because it goes from 0 to 2047. So here we can see the process passing through from sequence number uh, to acknowledgement number, and then the flags that are active. UDP, in contrast to TCP, is not considered reliable. doesn't mean it's not useful, it just means we can't rely on it to handle delivery of data that is guaranteed. There's no error checking, there's no sequencing, there's no flow control. But because there's less overhead, it is much faster and much more efficient. It's useful for things like live audio or video transmissions, anything that's considered to be delay sensitive. It's also more efficient for carrying messages that fit within one data packet. So anything that's really lightweight tends to do well uh, through UDP. UDP headers only contain four fields, source and destination port, length and checksum. The checksum field in UDP is also optional in IPv4, but is required in IPv6. So as you can see, when we compare it to the TCP header, it is much less complex. Uh, so we're able to make sure that it's processed much more quickly as it passes through those intermediary devices. IP operates at layer three, the network layer. This is gonna handle specification of where data should be delivered and identifies the source and destination IP addresses. Now, IP is the section of the TCP IP protocol suite that allows inter-networking to be completed. You can traverse more than one LAN segment and more than one type of network through a router. And as you move from router to router and subnets and intranets and what have you, the same information is able to be used in a universal addressing system. Now IP is also unreliable and connectionless like UDP. And this means that TCP is what we rely on to ensure delivery of data, session establishment, and reassembly in the correct sequence. So let's look at an IPv4 packet. This is much more complex than TCP because as we can see from the bottom, the TCP segment is attached. We can see version, differentiated services, total length, fragment offsets, uh, padding, source and destination IPs, all that stuff. So we've gone from a very basic uh, unit with the TCP segment and moved it into a packet. So we've, we've added some complexity. IPv6 uses a very different format and has to accommodate much longer IPv6 addresses. Please remember, IPv6 is four times the length in binary than IPv4. There's also no fragment offset field. The packet sizes are adjusted uh, by the hosts before transmission. So here we can see an IPv6 packet that looks very different in terms of the uh, complexity. It just basically transitions from one to the other. Uh, instead of having more options, it just has bigger address. Now ICMP is a layer three core protocol that reports on the success or failure of data delivery. ICMP is used by ping. Uh, it's also used um, to perform the functions of ARP, um, the address resolution protocol. So ICMP basically reports these messages and says, hey, this part of the network is congested or this data packet failed uh, or data has been discarded because the time it took to reach that point was longer than what we call the TTL or time to live time to live basically says if the packet is transmitting across this many hosts in order to reach its destination it's gone too far um, there is a social game that people have heard about of course called you know six degrees of separation or six degrees of Kevin Bacon if you specify on that um, and it, it it states that based on the number of connections that human beings experience 
there should be no more than six steps between any one person and Kevin Bacon, because he's known for being in a lot of ensemble parts. Well, that kind of lends itself to how network transmission works in that we have the internet. So we have this huge hierarchy. So if we path everything correctly, we should be able to quote unquote, climb the mountain, get up to the very you know top levels of transmission, the backbones of the internet, and be able to get to smaller sub networks very quickly. That doesn't always happen though, because of pathing issues or possibly um, infinite loops, broadcast storms, things like that. So ICMP can then announce that error has occurred and it can tell you what type of error it was based on the recipient information. It does not correct errors that it detects, however. It just says, hey, this happened. Um, it doesn't, doesn't try and fix it. Now for troubleshooting, this is invaluable. Um, you know, if we have to deal with trying to figure out why a particular connection isn't working, ICMP messages kicking back, you know, viewing it through Wireshark or another packet sniffer is going to make a huge difference. So here we can see just a basic ICMP packet, type, code, checksum, and then the contents can vary based on what's being sent back. And we can see here the different packets include this type of information. The type, code, checksum, as I said, uh, tends to be right around 64 bits for the proper header, and then the data, of course, is variable as well. So we, we mentioned this a second ago, and we're going to go in a little bit more depth. ARP, the Address Resolution Protocol. ARP cooperates with IPv4 to discover the MAC addresses of local hosts and then maintains a database that maps discovered local address matches. ARP is a Layer 2 protocol that uses IP in Layer 3 in order to perform its duties. It only operates within its local network, so it doesn't have to move outside of Layer 2, but Layer 3 makes it more efficient because it's able to identify things um, and, and be able to verify. ARP relies on broadcasting. So the ARP table is the database of IP to MAC address mappings, and whenever an ARP packet is requested, the broadcast flood begins. So here's a sample ARP table. So we see that we've got three IP addresses, three hardware addresses, and we can identify whether or not the type of connection is static or dynamic. Now, static assignments tend to be a little bit better priority-wise because they're not likely to change at the whim of uh, a power reset or somebody logging off or on. Dynamic addresses, however, because they're assigned by DHCP, are subject to uh, restarts and the, uh, the lease on the IP address uh, being locked out much faster than a static address. Now, an ARP table contains two different types of entries. Dynamic is created when an ARP request is made that cannot already be satisfied by what's present in the ARP table. Static requests is where um, somebody entered the entry manually using the ARP utility. This is usually for servers or other backbone devices. If we want to view a Windows Workstation's ARP table, if you just go into the command prompt and type in ARP-A, that'll give you exactly what you're looking for. It looks just like this. So we can see here on interface 192.168.2.115, we can see the internet address and physical addresses of all the various connections that are currently listed. Now, Ethernet is a protocol that you may hear about. This is the uh, most important layer two standard in current implementation. It's capable of running on a variety of different types of media. It's great throughput at a reasonable cost. And because it's standardized and everybody uses it, we have excellent interoperability. Ethernet 2 is the current standard we use, and the creation of the frame, which we talked about in the encapsulation process for layer 2, is tied directly to Ethernet's processing. So here we can see an Ethernet 2 frame as it would be built. The preamble uh, in SFD, which we'll talk about later on, is 8 bytes. The destination and source addresses are 6 bytes. The Ethernet type is 2 bytes. And then we have padding that goes anywhere from 46 to 1500 bytes. Then you have what's called the, uh, the FCS frame check sequence at the end, uh, that's four bytes. So the header and the FCS are what make up the 18 byte frame around the data. The data portion of an ethernet frame is based on what's called the MTU or maximum transmission unit. This is the largest size that router and the messages paths will allow. Um, so if a router says, hey, it can't be any bigger than 1100 bytes, then that MTU is 1100 but it can pad it up or down. Uh, I believe 15, 1518 is the cap. Yeah, that makes sense. I don't know why I had to guess on that. Uh, not often that you run into something like that though. Traditionally, it'll, it'll round itself out. Now there are some exceptions. 
Ethernet frames on a VLAN can have an extra 4-byte field between the source and uh, type field, and some special purpose networks also use what's called a jumbo frame. This isn't something I've ever seen implemented, but according to the standard, it can be as high as almost 9,200 bytes, which is massive. I can't imagine why you'd want to do that. I feel like the encapsulation process uh, for Ethernet 2 works really well. I haven't seen any implementations where I was like, hey, this frame would be much better if it was, you know, anywhere from two to four times the size. So now we've got all these protocols laid out. Let's figure out how we can make a router work. How do we join two networks together to be able to pass things from one local network to another? Um, we can interpret layer three and often layer four addressing. So we're dealing not only with uh, IPs, but with ports. And then we have the best path for data to follow. And that requires communication between routers to identify, hey, you know, recent traffic dictates that I have taken on this packet. So if you're trying to take something to a similar place, I'm your best, your best location. We can also reroute traffic if the path of first choice is down, but another known path is available. So there's a lot of complex calculations that are going on uh, at, at small intervals to be able to make sure that all of this information stays current. So here we see just some random graphics of IP-based, business-based, and consumer routers. You can see the IP-based routers, the big standing ones, are, are really massive. They have a lot of information that's routing through them, and they have a lot of interconnectivity that's done through direct fiber optic and serial connections. Um, the mid-range, the, the business one we see in the middle, you know, has several um, inputs to be able to handle. You know, in this case, it looks like you've got uh, two 16-port racks. Well, it's a 16 and a 12 with a 1 aux. Um, to connect what looks to be both a local internet and intranet connection. And then the Netgear router that we see on the far right, that's just a standard consumer, so that probably has one uh, input slot from the ISP, and then it has four output slots for the local LAN. Now, routers can perform any of these following optional functions, and I'll place emphasis on optional there. Filtering broadcast transmissions, preventing certain types of traffic from getting in, that's usually an implied um, intrusion prevention system based firewall. So a simultaneous local and remote connectivity can be supported. High network fault tolerance through redundant components, such as power supplies. Uh, that's what's called an online UPS that can connect directly to your router. Also to monitor network traffic and report various types of operational statistics and diagnose internal or other connectivity problems and trigger alarms as needed. So here we see uh, some different routers, core, edge, and exterior in the graphic on the right. So you can see that there are two autonomous systems. They have their own uh, what's called bounding range. So you've got your edge router and two core routers inside. Uh, on the right hand side you see it's a mesh system which has three core routers that are interlinked. In between them you see that there are uh, two ISP routers that are linking them together. So core routers, also called interior routers, direct data within the same AS. That's what we call an autonomous system. Edge routers connect autonomous systems to outside networks, and exterior routers are anything outside of your organization. So the thing that we have to be aware of is that whether or not something is considered an interior or exterior router is a matter of perspective. As an ISP, you have a pretty large interior structure, whereas uh, if you're a business, you probably have a much larger view of the exterior. Layer 3 switch, as we brought up a moment ago, is a multi-layer switch which is capable of interpreting layer three data and works much like a router. The hardware construction is really the primary difference. So there are some uh, pretty snazzy switches that are out there that handle all the routing stuff, um, but don't necessarily have the um, same physical size. They don't have the same connectivity to, you know, 16 or 32 ports. They're usually less expensive, but there's also a level of complexity that they cannot handle. So you, you still have to involve a router at some point. Layer four switches are known as application switches uh, or content switches. These can perform filtering, keep statistics, provide security functions. These are usually used as part of an internal network's backbone, um, usually structured into the MDF of a, of a large uh, infrastructure-based building. So how do we keep track of all this information? Well, we use what's called a routing table. Very much like DNS, which we talked about last chapter, we have a database that holds information about where hosts are located and the fastest or most efficient way to reach them. Routers rely on these tables to identify where the next hop is going to occur. And this is because the TTL, time to live, or hop limit, 
defines how long it'll take before a packet says, I've taken too many steps, I have to be discarded and find a better route. Routing tables contain IP addresses as well as subnet masks that identify a network that a host or another router belongs to. And it's almost like a game of what we would call telephone. It's a friend of a friend of a friend. The problem is, is that machines can't have interpretation, so these tables have to be highly accurate. Here we can see the routing table for each one identifying different locational hosts. So let's say that we've got a workstation on LAN A that needs to communicate with the network printer on LAN D. It will have to communicate with switch A, then router A, and then possibly, depending on the, the traffic situation, communicate with router B or C to make it to switch D, uh, and then be able to get to LAN D and talk to the network printer. Static routing is where a direct purposeful uh, maintained configuration is set up directly. Network administrator goes in and types in the route it wants to use to move between these different interconnectivity devices. Uh, dynamic routing automatically calculates the best path. Now this helps to fight, you know, down devices or congestion, but it also means that there's a lot more computational energy necessary to get the system finished. If we want to check out how the routing table is structured, we can use route on Unix or Linux, route print on Windows, or show IP route on Cisco iOS. There are a number of metrics that we use to determine what the best path is. Remember that machines can't really make decisions unless we give them a set of rules for doing so. So making a best path determination requires weighting these decisions based on a couple of variables. Hop count, so being able to uh, have a particular number of jumps between two devices. Theoretical bandwidth and actual output or throughput. Um, so how much is actually getting through versus how much should be getting through. If we have a big disparity there, then that means there's probably some kind of impediment between the two devices. Uh, or multiple devices if we're plotting a path that goes more than two across. Delay on a potential path, the load uh, or the processing burden if you will, the MTU of a particular transmission path, uh, trying to avoid fragmentation essentially, the routing cost, uh, that is the value assigned to a particular route, that's something you'll talk about uh, quite heavily in Net126, the reliability of a potential path, um, this is essentially saying whether or not it is a good path, is it likely to fail? And then the topology of a network, the actual physical links between intermediaries. Now the routing protocols we use um, are going to determine the best path based on the metrics we just discussed. So we look at things like administrative distance, we look at convergence time, and we look at overhead. So how reliable is the protocol that we're going to use? How long does it take for it to recognize the best path in the event of a change? and then how much burden is placed on the underlying network to actually make the protocol function. <clears throat> a lot of people don't realize this, but um, modern cryptography, in order to keep our internet traffic and other programs safe, actually requires more powerful computers to be able to even run. Um, not only does it take harder um, measures in terms of um, software, but in hardware as well to keep us safe, and overhead is uh, no different. That's how we distribute the load of getting the uh, transmission completed. So we've got a couple of different ones that we use. Uh, RIP and RIP version 2, version 2 of course being much more prominent. Uh, OSPF, uh, is is, which is Intermediate System to Intermediate System. Uh, IGRIP, which is Enhanced Interior Gateway Routing Protocol, and BGP, uh, Border Gateway Protocol. BGP is the only current implementation of EGP. We'll talk about what each of these means. So IGP, or interior gateway protocols, are used by core and edge routers within an autonomous system. And these are often grouped according to the algorithms they use to make the best path. Distance vector routing calculates a path based on distance to a destination. Link state routing enables routers to communicate beyond their neighbors in order to independently map the network. So rather than trying to make a jump from one to the other and recalculating every time they hit a new transition, they're able to say, okay, I'm going to gather some information from router A, B, and C in this path and try and calculate based on that. Exterior gateway protocols, EGP, is used by an edge router and other exterior devices to distribute data outside of the autonomous system. And BGP is the only current example. So here we can see that we've got our autonomous system uh, map from the previous slide brought back, but now 
instead of uh, listing what type of router something is, we're also including our routing protocols. We can see that BGP goes between the edge routers and exteriors, and then we've got RIP, OSPF, ISIS, and IGRIP on the interiors of our autonomous systems. So OSPF, or Open Shortest Path First, is an IGP link state protocol used on interior or border routers. This was introduced as an improvement to RIP. It supports large networks, which unlike RIP, uh, imposes no hop limits. It uses a more complex algorithm, so that increases our overhead. Um, it maintains a database of other router links. Even though it is demanding more memory and CPU power for calculations, it has very fast convergence, and it keeps memory bandwidth to a minimum. There's stability involved in order to prevent routing loops by using internal algorithms, and then we support all modern multi-vendor routers. So if it's, you know, Linksys, Juniper, uh, Cisco, doesn't really matter, it should work using OSPF. That's the great thing about open source protocols. ISIS uh, deals with link state routing that is similar to OSPF, but is designed only for core routers. Um, it's not limited to IPv4 like OSPF is, and it's easier to use with IPv6. Service providers generally prefer ISIS because it's much more scalable, and scalable when you're talking about an internet service provider is very different than when you're talking about a business. IGRIP, Enhanced Interior Gateway Routing Protocol, is a distance vector protocol that combines a couple of different features of link state. It's often referred to as a hybrid protocol, has the same fast convergence time that we like to see, and a very low network overhead. It's less CPU intensive, so there's not as much hardware burden, and it's much easier to configure. Multiple protocols are supported, and it does limit unnecessary traffic between routers, which can reduce the amount of overhead further. It was originally proprietary to Cisco. Now, BGP is the protocol of the internet, border gateway protocol. It spans multiple autonomous systems. It's a path vector protocol that communicates via BGP specific messages that travel between routers. So unfortunately, that tends to limit the amount of com competition that could be derived for this because everything relies on BGP for external gateways. Um, it can be configured to follow policies that might avoid certain routers or instruct a group of routers to prefer a particular route. This is called route weighting, um, W-E-I-G-H-T, not W-A-I-T. It is the most complex of the routing protocols, as you would expect for the uh, outer hierarchy. Now, there's a ton of utilities that are out there to try and work with stuff. I tend to like the internal stuff that's you know built into the, the OS of what I'm working with. Um, there are some more polished ones that you can deal with that have GUIs and stuff, but this is this is much more of a uh, first party kind of situation. So Netstat, this is network statistics, displays TCP IP statistics and details. Um, you can find what port a service is running on, what connections are currently established, how many messages have been handled by an interface since it was activated, and how many errors have occurred. You can see here on the right, there's a ton of different flags. Uh, N F A E S R O B. Um, you know, you can obviously read through all of those. Um, definitely sit and practice with those. I believe there is a mind tap assignment that we have assigned for those. Trace route uh, or trace RT, just pronounced the same way, uses echo requests to trace the path from one node to another and identifies each step along the way. So Linux, Unix, and OSX systems use Traceroute to send UDP messages to a random port on the destination node. The concept's the same as Traceroute for Windows. <coughs> Excuse me. Both of them employ trial and error to discover nodes. Now there's three reasons why a trace test might fail prematurely. Either your target is down, your target's too busy to process lower priority messages, or the target does not accept these transmissions due to a firewall uh, exception or, or rejection. Now, a trace cannot detect router configuration problems or predict the variations of routes over time. That's why it uses a trial and error approach at every hop. In the graphic on the right, you can see from router 1 to 2 to your destination that you have your TTL changing and uh, sending back the necessary uh, modifications. So at this point, it's like a UDP with TTL 1 would fail at router 1 and the router one message would kick back. Same thing with TTL two and three. What that means for a, a message that has a 128 
uh, count TTL would be it goes to router 1, jumps to 127, then 126, 125. Once it reaches 125 and it has communication with the source node, uh, all of the information from the previous packets is now able to be factored into trace root. Path ping, very similar. It uses elements of ping and trace route to provide deeper information about network issues along a route, it sends multiple pings to each node along a route, um, and compiles information into a single report. That should say hop, not hope, by the way. Um, so if we go to pathping n for google.com, uh, the dash n flag is going to say do not resolve the IP address to host names. I'm just going to go ahead and path that. Uh, if we say dash h12, it means that we're going to specify that it needs to be 12 hops. Uh, dash p2000 means uh, 2000 milliseconds needs to be intervaled between those pings. And then q4 uh, limits the number of queries per hop to, in this case, four. Now you have to include a variable for the last three here, otherwise it'll just default to the originals. TCP dump, um, this is a command line packet sniffer that runs on uh, Linux and other Unix OSs. This captures traffic that crosses a network interface. It can be either filtered or played back um, as it is a live recording essentially. Now the sudo command is required um, in order to run TCP dump or you can log in as the root administrator. Sudo, for those of you who don't know, is basically a force command to make something do what it needs to do. Um, as you can see down at the bottom of the table, you can see the dash W and dash R flags. Those output to file or read from file. So that's when it says it can be played back. Uh, it's not like it reads it back in audio form, but if you want to see the output in sequence, TCP dump uh, dash W and dash R would be what you'd use. And then here are a couple of other command line utilities that we use quite a bit. Uh, you can see ARP, DIG, IP and IF config, netstat, nmap. Be careful about nmap because depending on the network you're on, it might automatically boot you. Uh, NSLOOKUP, PATHPING, uh, MTR or monitor on Linux, uh, ping, route, trace dump, or TCP dump, I'm sorry, and then trace route or trace RT. So let's look at some common problems. Duplicate max. That's a pretty big issue because Macs aren't supposed to be uh, changed, right? Well, Mac addresses can be impersonated. This happens most often when you're managing multiple virtual devices on a large network. A lot of switches will detect the problem uh, and produce error messages to alert you of this. Um, you can actually pre-program them to automatically reject traffic from those devices until the problem is corrected. Uh, it's just a matter of tracking them down and updating the configuration. If you can't find it and it turns out it is a rogue device, uh, then that can be a really easy way to try and flag that. Hardware failure. This is where a router, switch, NIC, or other item goes down. You can use Traceroute uh, to track down malfunctioning routers or other devices on a larger network. You can get more accurate trace feedback by targeting a node on the other side of the router rather than aiming for the router itself because the way that it processes or does not process the traffic um, will tell you a little bit more about what the problem actually is. And then of course ping being able to test for connectivity at all. It may be that um, it's not configured for HTTP encrypted traffic, HTTPS, but it is encrypted for just standard connectivity. So you might want to figure out why is my secure traffic not going through? Ping would give you that first step. Discovering neighbor devices. So neighbor discovery is built in uh, through ARP on IPv4. IPv6 has a different item called NDP, or neighbor discovery protocol. Um, and it does automatically adjust when neighboring nodes fail or are removed. So this eliminates the extra need for ARP and ICMP in an IPv6 network. Um, not to say that those functions aren't useful, but for IPv6, if they want to reduce overhead because of the larger message count or things like that, or, or the address size, um, that's just kind of the adjustments that these engineers tend to do. And here's our chapter summary. So if you have any questions or concerns, always you can contact me at my Google voice number, my email address, or through Blackboard. Uh, if I can see you in class and you want to actually ask your questions directly, I'll be glad to talk to you about it. Thank you guys so much for your time and attention. I hope you're doing well, staying safe, and I will see you next class.